On August 5, 1930, a group of men on a remote sealing expedition came across something much more interesting and way more gruesome. Hoping to find a fresh supply of seal meat, they instead excavated the remains of a crew of explorers long thought to be lost forever. Today, we're giving you the cold hard truth about the S.A. Andrea Arctic Balloon Expedition that vanished for 30 years. But before we float on, why not subscribe to the Weird History Channel? Then head into the comments and let us know what other spooky discoveries you want to hear about. Okay, time to find out how this balloon got popped. Flying to the North Pole in the 1890s was already a dicey idea, primarily because your only choices of a flying vehicle back then were a hot air balloon or a catapult. But it was even more dangerous if you didn't know what you were doing. To his credit, S.A. Andrea did dabble in the art of ballooning, but not as much as he probably should have. The man with the idea to fly across the world in a dangerous contraption had only begun flying hot air balloons in 1892, a short five years before the fateful expedition. In fact, from the time he took his first flight to the time of his final mission, Andrea had only taken nine flights covering about 900 miles over 40 total hours. That's like playing Microsoft Flight Simulator for a weekend and then strapping yourself into an F-14. The plan was simple. Andrea and his crew would take their balloon along a strategically chosen set of Norwegian islands, which were located a mere 650 miles away from the North Pole. You know, that place where Santa has a timeshare. Andrea was posed to reach farther north than any other expedition had ever been, and only a few hours would have separated him from glory. Andrea's calculation said that the crew would reach the North Pole within 43 hours. Based on the records that the crew kept, we know their hot air balloon, the Eagle, took off as planned on July 11th, 1897. We also know that it struck something. After that, the balloon went up a few hundred feet before falling so far that they skimmed the water below. We don't know what attempts the crew made to save themselves, but records show that they lost sight of land after an hour and were down for the count by July 14th, 65 hours after they'd taken off. As luck or maybe fate would have it, Andrea's dream of crashing a hot air balloon came up at the perfect time. Sweden's King Oscar II had a strong desire to reach the North Pole, and Andrea was just the guy to do it. The 1800s saw the start of an Arctic race, as many countries battled to be the first to discover and explore the North Pole. Hey, maybe there was treasure up there. The point was, nobody knew. There had been a few expeditions before Andrea threw his hat into the ring. All had traveled by land, and all had failed to reach the North Pole. According to the New Yorker, Andrea's belief was that the last unvisited place should be discovered by the Swedes, a point of view Sweden absolutely loved. This gained Andrea's expedition national attention. Concerns about the practicality of such a mission were raised, but were subsequently ignored. Swedish Arctic fever had already taken over. Andrea was a scientist first, and an explorer second. And as a science-thinking man, he believed that aerial travel, specifically the hot air variety, could take humans to yet unreachable places. This planted the seed of his eventual expedition in Andrea's head. He took his first hot air balloon flight in 1892, accompanied by the seasoned balloon captain, Francesco Cetti. From that point on, Andrea set his sights on purchasing his own balloon. With a little assistance from a public science fund, he bought a balloon named Svea and went on to complete nine successful flights. Andrea's nine flights provided several examples of how unpredictable and downright uncontrollable hot air balloons can be. For instance, passing clouds caused sudden and dramatic gains and losses in altitude, like the world's worst roller coaster, or greatest, depending on how you feel about projectile vomiting. Physically, Andrea reported the sudden altitude shifts triggered a rapid pulse and a faint singing noise on the left side of his skull. According to WebMD, he was suffering from balloon fever. So he couldn't really control the balloon and flying in it caused him physical pain. Clearly, he had no choice but to buy an extremely expensive balloon. The Eagle hot air balloon used by the expedition was manufactured specifically for the purposes of flying into the Arctic. To make such an unstoppable inflatable machine, construction was done in Paris using various silk fibers and protective coatings to make it waterproof. The balloon was also outfitted with guide ropes to be used for steering and speed control. The whole shebang ended up costing around 50,000 francs, and it was so large it had to be specially transferred with the help of the Royal Navy. 
The fabulous contraption was stored in a special balloon house, five stories high, where it could be safely inflated. Andrea did use his practice flights to test different control and steering methods to assist him while trying to control an unpredictable balloon over the Arctic. He had learned to use drag ropes and sails to slow and steer the balloon when the wind was strong. Unfortunately, these methods did little to assist him during his doomed flight. The ill-fated journey to the North Pole wasn't Andrea's first sky rodeo. He had attempted another launch one year prior in 1896. The initial flight was scheduled for a summer day and included the team of Neil Zekholm, a meteorologist, and Niels Strindberg, a physics professor, which was probably a little confusing. Was every available scientist named Niels? A string of bad weather caused the flight to be pushed back a few days, then weeks. This resulted in Andrea and the crew becoming discouraged and pushing the launch until the following summer. But the next year, Ekholm would not return, citing reservations about the viability of the trip. He saw what happened the year before, deduced that the balloon probably wouldn't be able to retain the hydrogen needed to complete the trip, and smartly backed out. These totally valid concerns were dismissed, and Ekholm was replaced with engineer Knut Frankel. In fact, Andrea wasn't about to hear any criticism of his planned expedition. Not even when the Albany Express called out his blatant disregard for the safety of the crew in the cold. The publication wrote, How the men expect to protect themselves from the cold is not even suggested, and pointed out, It is impossible to shield the frail car of a balloon from the intense cold of the open air. The final line of the article even predicted the tragic fate of the journey. It will result in the sacrifice of several human lives. Nothing more. So why wouldn't Andrea listen? Well, hubris and stubbornness seem likely explanations. He did plan a hot air balloon expedition into one of the most inhospitable areas of the world with barely any flight experience. But some have insinuated that Andrea was depressed and that his state of mind contributed to the failure of the mission. In between the first attempt in 1896 and the second launch a year later, Andrea's mother unexpectedly passed away. Andrea was incredibly close with his mother after losing his father as a teenager. Having never been married, his mom and his balloons were really all he had going for him. It is even reported that Andrea wrote of her passing, The only thread which bound me to the wish to live is cut off. And he wound up naming the expedition's final base camp Mina Andrea's place after his beloved mother. But journal entries show that he maintained a chipper attitude in public while mourning privately. In August of 1930, the Bratvog sealing expedition thought they'd struck seal gold. Well, figuratively speaking. They had just gotten access to the near impassable White Island and hoped to reap the benefits of its untapped sealing opportunities. What they didn't expect to find were the frozen remains of a long-lost amateur balloonist. But deep in the ice of the archipelago of Svalbard, they found an icy boat and Andre's headless body. Not the thing you want to find on a dangerous expedition at the end of the world. Andrea was discovered leaning up next to a rock with the crew's boat close by. How he got there is unknown. Even the events of his death are up for debate. The placement of his hunting gun and preservation of his journal suggests he was not in any direct danger at the time and possibly just passed away where he sat. Frankel and Strindberg were found not too far away, along with their own journals and 200 photographs taken throughout the expedition. And before you ask, there were no monsters in any of the pictures that we know of. So what happened? The list of theories that have been posited throughout the years include lead poisoning from the lead-laced cans of food, botulism, suicide, scurvy, and polar bear attacks. Wait a second, did the polar bear prop Andrea up next to his gun to throw us off? Seems far-fetched, but maybe that's exactly what the bear wants us to think. The most popular theory, however, has the crew hunting and eating a polar bear, only to develop trichinosis from undercooking the meat. However, no signs of the disease were found on the cadavers. The bodies were all cremated shortly after their return to Sweden, so we'll likely never know what exactly happened to them. The only evidence of the crew's final days comes from the journals of the three men and a couple hundred photographs of the journey. The logs were all very different, but could be pieced together to provide a detailed account of their progress throughout the journey. Andrea's notes included details of the journey, food stocks, disposition of the crew, and geographic positioning. Frankel's, on the other hand, was all science, while Strindberg's journals were more personal and reflective. 
The positivity noted at the beginning of their journey stuck with them until the end, as they described the beauty of the snow and ice and the polar bears. Andrea's entries go on throughout the month to discuss the drudgery of pulling the sledges for hours on end, and the sometimes inability to advance more than a thousand meters. But in between the problems, Andrea's writings were mostly positive, noting the beauty of the ice capes, the excellent health of the crew, and the assurance that they would make it home. As their bodies began to ail against the frozen air, the entries became more and more labored. In his final entries, Andrea reflects on how nice it is to be sleeping out on the ice, and his hope to get moving again once the weather permits. So what do you think? Would you ever go out on a hot air balloon expedition? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.